too many women have died. What if we could prevent breast cancer before it starts? During puberty, a woman's breast is very sensitive to carcinogens, and that damage from carcinogens are thought to make women at risk for breast cancer when we all become adults. Women are exposed to many carcinogens. When I was in North Carolina, what would happen is the factories would load up sprayer trucks and go into poor neighborhoods, and they would spray all the chemicals on the road. And the little girls, thinking that this was cool water, would go and run behind the trucks trying to be in the spray. But there are all kinds of other exposures. There are pesticides, there's polluted water, and there's also hair care products and beauty products that are contaminated with hormones. What if we could prevent exposure during puberty? How many breast cancers could we prevent? So this is just what we want to do. We want to start working with young women who are pre-puberty. We want to help them to start to identify the carcinogens in their environment. We want to help develop with them low-cost strategies to avoid exposures. And then we want to work with our advocates to make sure that these women are not just passive passengers. We want to help them be advocates so they can advocate for their right to live in a world free of cancer-causing agents that promote breast cancer. So what do we want to do? Well, first thing is we have an NIH-funded program that allows us to partner with our neighborhood schools. These are schools where the kids are mostly poor, immigrant, Latino, and black. And actually, some of our graduates here are sitting in the back. Um, and what we want to do is partner and select, with the permission of the schools and the parents, we want to find about 100 um, eight to 13 year old women, and we want to part them, partner them with our graduates here, back here, who would be their mentors. And so we want to develop a big sister mentor and a young woman pair, and this is the unit that would be interacting with our team. So we want the team to go then and start looking at a woman's environment, to start to figure out what a woman is exposed to, and then take samples so our scientific team can start to test these environmental agents. Then we want to go develop prevention strategies. Some of them are very simple. You got pesticides on food, you go wash them. You have contaminants in hair care products, don't use them. We've been able to pilot these strategies, and we found that they've been very successful. Then once we start to look at the samples, we also want to collect the cells in the saliva of our young women. And we want to ask a very important question, which is, if you have specific carcinogens that the women are exposed to, how much DNA damage are they sustaining? And then we want to develop and look at our prevention strategies and say, OK, if we start preventing exposure, do we lower the levels? And very importantly, are we able to stop this DNA damage? Now, there are all kinds of DNA damage events that can occur. You can have mutation, where a hunk of the DNA is taken out. Usually, that's thought to be pretty irreversible. But there are other kinds, like epigenetic damage, where normally the DNA is spun around a spool or a histone, and that can get unraveled. A little unraveling is fine. A lot is really bad. So we want to see, at the time of puberty, how much damage is there, and if we get rid of the contaminants, can we fix it? Then we want to go work with our really, really cool advocacy team. And actually, Susan is here in the audience. We have both legislators and we have advocates. And we want to go take our young women, and we want to help them to become advocates in their own right. We want to present their program to their school, to their parents, and also start to interface with the legislature, so uh, the California Senate, and also the US House. And this is through the partnerships that we have existing. All right, so initially, we're going to start in Southern California. We live in LA. That's our home. That's our neighborhood. Those are our people. But after one and two years, we want to start expanding our program. After year one and year two, we will go and evaluate it. We'll go perfect it. And then we want to expand it to our local advocates and also to our partners uh, internationally. Our goal here is. We have a dream, and we have a purpose. We want to go create a generation of empowered young women who will advocate for their health, be able to go and avoid exposures, 
and then be able to go out and demand environmental justice and to live in a world free of breast cancer prevention, breast cancer agents. Thank you very much. Exactly at five minutes, that was great. Um, what a great role model, five minutes exactly. Um, uh, and do the judges have any questions? I just have one question. How would you avoid selection bias, avoiding uh, working with only the most motivated women um, and not being sure then that it would work with the most vulnerable? So I think first we're gonna have to work with the most motivated because those are our initial group. Those are the people who we're gonna test things out with and we're gonna go and see what works and what doesn't. So those are the people that we need initially. And we've got a whole bunch of them in this room. But I think ultimately, what your point is really good. Then we wanna start expanding it to the school in general. And so this is why it's really nice we have our NIH funded STEM program, because that involves the whole school. So initially we thought, you know, if we're piloting things, getting feedback, you know, 100 is a good number to work with. But then we really want to be able to expand so we don't have that selection bias. And that's a great question. I have one additional question. You put, mentioned can your you team put members. the mic up at your You mic. mentioned your team members. Could you have them raise their hands? Up we go. Actually, you guys stand up. Come on. Don't be shy. <laughs> so they came all the way from LA. And it's up. Come on, Alan. Up we go. <laughs> <laughs> So these are our big sips. And my follow-up to that is, are you working with members in your community already on your SoCal STEM project? Yes, very much so. So we're moving, we've, um, Chris Sistrunk, who's my partner, um, he has gone and developed relationships with five different school systems with the principals and has already implemented in the school system these prevention programs. We have interface with the, um, with this, not only the school districts, but also the local government as well. So um, we're in there, and we're in there for a good time, for, for a good reason. Then we also have uh, clinics that are free clinics where we provide free services, and we have a partnership program for moms and daughters to institute healthy living, buying food that's healthy, and doing exercise programs that can be done on a budget in the home. So we're there. Any other questions from the judges? Uh, the one I had is this, will this all be student citizen scientists or does it move to a professional level at some point? So not the, the, I don't want to say you're no, not professional. No, but. no, no. They're, they're going to be professionals very soon. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, initially, the sample collection and the querying will be, will be student, uh, student scientists. But the actual analysis, we have a whole group, and actually some of our environmental scientists are here. We have a whole group at City of Hope of people who do epigenetic studies, who do chromatin analysis, who do microRNA analysis, who do environmental toxicology studies. And we also have some of our partners from our international breast cancer program here. So we have a great, we have a very wide um, bench of people who do uh, very fancy scientific assays. And then my, one of my other questions was, will there be two groups, one that has an intervention and one that doesn't? Initially, no, because we're dealing with a small number, and I think what we need to really do is first test this out. What we would then ultimately do is do a randomized placebo-controlled trial, and you know, normally I run a lot of prevention trials like this, uh, but initially we really need to develop all the feasibility, get the kinks out, and make sure it's working well. Mm -hmm. well and Yes. Dr. Love, I'll repeat the question. If you're going to use um, saliva instead of something like nickel aspirate fluid, you can get non-invasively with actually uh, breath. Because... Would you, would it, you repeat the question? Okay. The question is, why don't we get nipple aspirate fluid? And the reason is because we're, deal we're dealing with 8 to 13-year-olds. Okay. So to get IRB approval, yeah. spit... <laughs> No, no, they, they, ha they have hopefully not gotten pregnant. But even if they have, they're, they're young women, and IRB-wise, they're really good at spitting, and they spit with great gusto. But other stuff, <laughs> no way. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, Victoria. Oh, yes, sorry. You have a plaque here. Put your <laughs> Okay. All right. <laughs> I was trained, but it didn't stick. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome.